Greetings, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition for our third episode of the Wisdom Keeper podcast. This is Dr. Miles Neal. I still am on the island of Bali, where I have been for the last five weeks, and just now coming to the end of a very, very auspicious and special visit here, filled with wonder, filled with magic, filled with mystery, and filled with awe. And in light of the current special edition podcast here on the island where we're bringing you an interview I had early on with wisdom keeper Jokade Kartyasa, a homeopathic doctor, a physician, member of the the royal family, the prince of Abood, and a longtime lineage holder, some 22-generation lineage holder of the line of the Balinese ceremony and healing capacities and healing wisdom of the island. It was a utmost, utmost auspicious meeting. I'd like to just fill you in on our the, the uh, situation that led up to my meeting, Jokade, and also a little bit of some of the wondrous experiences I had after the interview, which I think are emblematic of what it means to meet and to study with and to be led by a wisdom keeper. And also, since we are amidst a series on pilgrimage, I thought I might just give you a little taste of one he led me on. So without further ado, the auspicious synchronicity in which I met Jokade was that I was traveling on Qatar Airlines on my way over to Bali. And it's a long flight from New York City of Kilaifs, and I was in one of those daydream zones, <laughs> that sort of temporal bardo on the flight, scrolling through something to watch, and uh, managed to make it through to the documentary section. And there I found a short series on Bali and thought I might educate myself a little bit before I landed. And it was a series of maybe six interviews. Uh, and I found one particularly interesting, it depicted a what I would suggest would be a cleric or religious figure or spiritual head, maybe a, um, a, a tribal elder uh, dressed in white following him through the streets of what now I know is a Bud, uh, interacting with the locals, a leading ceremony, discussing in very good English the uh, nature of the ceremony and the nature of the relationship to the land and most especially, most uh, uh, specifically the, the spirits that inhabit this land, which is a topic of very growing interest to me as I, as my days here continue. The relationship to the world of spirit is undeniable here and very and one that requires tremendous sensitivity and respect because the spirits are not all gentle and accommodating. Uh, there, there are a host of spirits and energies that also need quite a lot of attention and navigating, appeasing, uh, lest they get us ensnared. And so, nevertheless, I had a, I was drawn in by the charisma of this figure and what he had to say, but most particularly his demeanor, his mode of interaction. And I uh, later Googled him and found that he was indeed the king of Abud. And then I was searching a little more and found that of uh, he had uh, members of his family, one in particular. A, a, a homeopathic physician with a thriving practice of herbal remedies, homeopathic treatments on the island in Abud in a clinic that he created called Tirta Usada. And I, on a whim, following intuition, as I have been on most of my journeys, and particularly those amidst the pandemic, emailed him requesting an interview and telling him a little bit about my background and a little bit about the Wisdom Keeper podcast. 
the nature of the podcast and how it is a platform to really showcase, give respect to the elders and to the uh, the keepers of sacred knowledge so that those traditions remain active and alive. Well, it, 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 from the back end later, it, it, he told me he was hesitant. <laughs> of course, he's very busy and has a thriving practice. I think he is booked out some four or five months in advance. Uh, he was a little hesitant, not knowing who I was. Uh, but for whatever reason, and again, there's plenty of synergy and synchronicity on the serendipity on the island. He uh, permitted the interview, and we went up to uh, behind his clinic to his family home, which was lovely and beautiful. And, uh, and, and there uh, he told me some insider stories that the family home sits above a beautiful, auspicious site, a meditation cave in which his grandfather in his line had some very profound realizations was a yogi himself and so that mountain region upon which the clinic sits and the family home sits is sacred land uh, particularly for the family but um, was palpable and resonant in our interview i hit it off quite well with jock Day. he's uh, slightly younger than me but of the same ilk and cut from the same cloth he was educated in Australia. He did his homeopathic physician's training there. Also a, trained as a health scientist and researcher, particularly with interest recently in virology and the virus and the pandemic and its, uh, and its uh, progression and also treatments. Particularly, He's particularly uh, booked out obviously because of the pandemic and people wanting alternatives which he provides he's not one of these purists he is very much of a triage person which he mentions in the podcast someone who understands that biomedical science and surgery have their place uh, but 90 percent of what he sees uh, impacting us is our emotions we are he shares my opinion that our emotions are being stirred up unfortunately by several uh, several lines of pressure uh, from governments and uh, media and that uh, we have in a way forgotten that we have so much potential in our body and minds to heal naturally uh, and then there is a wonderful extension to our, our natural bodies, our natural immune system, but nature itself offers such an abundance and plurethora of healing remedies and medicinal uh, uh, recipes that he has kept and innovated with in his practice. And so we had a fantastic uh, conversation that n not only during the interview, which, which we're leading up into right now, which is our first encounter, but then we have enjoyed each other's company since then and we talked long into the night several nights he and i and then i just wanted to mention a pilgrimage jocko de cardassia uh, was uh, in invited me on which became much like a symbolic pilgrimage for both of us and i wanted to share some of that or just a glimpse of that with you since we are on the pilgrimage series and then I want to share some comments about what it means to be a wisdom keeper. Uh, you know, he kindly said, would you like to go up to one of the sacred mountains, Mount Abang, for sunrise? And of course, I'm keen to do just about anything with the wisdom keepers. So I agreed without thinking much about it. As he said, you know, we'll go up there for sunrise. We probably need to leave around 3 a.m. I said, that's fine. We met early at his family home probably around 11 o'clock p.m. the prior night and talked into the night and lost track of time. There's so much to discuss and so much what I call the pomegranate seeds of karmic energies popping and firing between us that we made it to around 2 o'clock in the, in the night or in the morning, drove out to the, to the base of the mountain, which took about an hour, and so without any sleep, we arrived there in the middle of the dark together. 
and he invited a local guide to take us up the mountain. So the three of us began our journey in the night together, and uh, I was ill-prepared for what was ahead, which is, in a way, part of the symbolic nature of the pilgrimage. You never quite know what you're about to enter into or encounter, uh, you know, your willingness to go into the unknown is part of the mythological rite of passage. The journey was not straightforward. It, it, it was arduous and difficult and treacherous and very, very scary. The path was not carved. It was not even ground. It was at times very treacherous and dangerous. We were at times, you know, hacking through thicket and thorn. We were at other times crawling on our belly and grabbing onto the roots of trees to pull ourselves up to the next incline. Um, at other places, it would even out. And then before you knew it, you were all again, once again, in a very tough stretch. The journey lasted about three and a half hours in darkness. It was augmented by periodic uh, prayers done at shrines, and Jokade informed me that Mount Abang is famous as being the sort of um, place of a king of old who protected his people and his vassal and his community by gifting them areas in and around the mountain uh, to protect them, to give them refuge. And he had several kind of spiritual awakenings in and around the mountain, and these awakening, the places of these awakenings are punctuated by little shrines along the way to the summit. And so we would stop at these shrines to catch our breath, share a little tea, make offerings, do prostrations in my case. I put my head, forehead, full body down on the ground in reverence to the land and in respect to the spirits. And uh, we made some prayers to, for protection for the next leg of the journey, and we made our way up. Well, about three quarters up, I sort of broke. I mean, to be quite honest, I was lagging behind. I, I, I'm a quite a fit person. I'm capable of running at least half marathons. I exercise regularly, but I was uh, really, really spent about three quarters of the way up. We had entered into a very narrow, narrow uh, stretch. Um, and I said to Dr. Day, who was up above me, uh, a little bit further ahead from me, I said, uh, you know, this is the birth canal. I felt we were close to the top, and I felt like we had, we were experiencing the throngs and the throes of the contractions, and we entered into this little narrow tunnel of thorn and thicket, and I felt squeezed, and I had a moment where if you're listening you may in the last year or two of the pandemic and the walls closing in also had a moment where you weren't quite sure where you were how you were going to survive and if you were going to make it and in a way when you're in the birth canal there is no going back and in a way in the pandemic, though many of us are grasping for air and seeking ground and looking for a return of normality, it is very much true that there is no going back. And so I think it is very fitting to just share this experience of not being able to go back, having no comfort, being lost in the midst of a trial, and not thinking you can go forward. So you can't go forward, you can't go back, you can't go up, you can't go down, you are stuck and gasping for air. And it dawned on me that I had been longing and yearning for the summit. And with each and every step, I was hoping we would turn a corner and the incline would even out and we would reach a nice, glorious summit. And then I had a couple of intuitions. First, that this process was one of purification. I had a lot of very intense emotions come up, a lot of arrogance and a lot of regret. I was thinking about my family. I was thinking about my kids. I was thinking about how my career has dominated my worldview and my, my energy. 
and I had, and in a way, I had missed my kids. I had not given them enough of my attention. I was filled with regret. I was really missing my boys after four and a half weeks of being away from them. They're still young kids. And so I, I was filled with intense emotion. Tears were coming down. I was paralyzed, couldn't go back, couldn't go forward. And then I had this sort of inner voice say, stop thinking about the summit, focus on the next step. It's all about one step at a time when you're in the throes of confusion, distress, despair, depression, any of you out there that are struggling with addiction, with trauma, where it just seems like life is impossible, that there is no way out, that there's no way forward, that there is no clearing, that there is no refuge, to focus just on one step at a time. So that's one of the lessons that I learned from our pilgrimage to the summit of Mount Abanga. The second lesson that I want to share with you is that once we had arrived there, it was actually a very glorious day. There was no rain. It was clear up above. We reached the summit where there's a shrine, a beautiful shrine up there, and then a vista, un a paralleled vista with a cloud coverage below. So you're like almost like at Mount Olympus looking down upon very thick uh, like layer of clouds and then there was Mount Batur below us which is the active volcano Mount Batur and uh, just very uh, timeless like you could be thousands and thousands of years back like a prehistoric age and uh, it occurred to me that and I remember as soon as we got there, I fell into a very deep embrace with Chakade, and I was tearing up, and we had both kind of made it, and uh, both really experiencing just the fallout and the dropping of the defenses and a real sense of shared vulnerability, a tearful embrace, which I think, in a way, sealed our relationship. I mean, he was kind enough to extend the podcast. We were hitting it up in our conversations leading up to this moment. But being tested in such a way was like a very dramatic in interlude or way in, a way to get into the soul level where two souls mingled and so I had this other thought that I just want to share with you as we continue our study of pilgrimage that the destination is never as important as the journey or the process of getting there. And that may seem cliche when we start talking about the diamond throne of Bodhgaya or the Bodhi tree where the Buddha gained enlightenment. It is, of course, true that those places are immensely powerful destinations. But I think we can lose sight of the days, weeks, and months leading up to those destinations are part of the pilgrimage. And in this case, to our summiting of Mount Abang, had there been a very smooth path, had there been a cable car, up to the summit had there been a stream of sherpas and uh, mules to ride up to the summit had it been made or laid or paved easy for us to arrive there lovely and un, un uh, unblemished what would we have gained at the summit what would we have gained as a result of an easy, swift climb. And I think this is the difference between tourism and pilgrimage because tourists are about getting to the destination, snapping a few shots, taking what they can for their memory bank, 
and departing, whereas pilgrimage is about the journey. And Jokade and I, I asked him much later about what happened on his, and he, he agreed with me and concurred with me and had a very similar experience of purification, had a very similar experience of going through a dark night, even though temporarily, both symbolically and literally going through the dark night. And I think this is part and parcel of the message of pilgrimage is that there is no treasure without the trial, that the rite of passage and the purification and the shedding and the growth that is required, that the mountain summons from us, requires from us as a kind of offering, is required to make good at the summit and to really appreciate the destination. And so, yes, what a very powerful, profound way to seal a relationship of a lifetime. I feel like I've known Jokude for a very long time, possibly even prior lives. It's that intimate, that close. And so I'm very, very honored to introduce you to him in this podcast. And I later asked him what Mount Abang meant, what it translated as. And he asked didn't know himself, asked the local guide, and the translation came through that Mount Abang, given the mythology of the king that took care of his, uh, to, to, took care of the local people there. Mount Abang means the mountain of gifts. And so I love the mythology there with Jokade and I receiving the gifts of our pilgrimage of purification up the summit. And I hope you benefit too. Now, one final word on the importance of the wisdom keeper. The first week that I landed here in Bali, I was making my way through what probably is a very common experience in Bali where you just sort of get bombarded by the veneer. You know, it's very beautiful here, of course, and of course, we're in a little bit of a strange situation with the pandemic, but nevertheless, Bali has gained an international rep rep reputation as a tourist destination. People come here for a couple of weeks. They enjoy the natural beauty. They probably stay with two, within two or three of the, the main hubs. Um, they have sort of very luxurious life experiences as holiday makers tend to uh, really you know, try to maximize their gratifications of being on holiday in a beautiful space with beautiful weather and lovely food and rest and relaxation and all the rest of it. <clears throat> but that was not the purpose of my coming here. The purpose of my coming here was to meet someone like Jokade, and I was very fortunate to meet him, follow the intuition and the breadcrumb trail, meet him right away. And the power of the wisdom keeper to open portals on the land and to invite you into ancient lineage, prayer, ceremony, and the secret spots where real Bali is still alive and active. For that, I am indebted for the rest of my life to Chalkade for his graciousness as being a welcoming host and really opening up the doors, the hidden doors of Bali for me to see some of its raw, natural, and wondrous beauty. So I just want to thank him, his family, and Bali itself as I'm about to sign off for my almost five weeks here. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Jokade Kartyasa is a kind, kind soul, very wonderful, reputed, respected healer, and will inevitably be the next in line keeper of his family lineage. Enjoy. Episode 3 of the Wisdom Keeper podcast.
So I'm here with Dr. Day at his lovely home, Tirta Asada. Tirta Asada? Tirta Usada. And it's uh, my delight and my pleasure to be invited into your home. It's so kind of you at short notice uh, to meet a stranger and to invite me in is, uh, I think, a good testament to the Bali Balinese and culture. So One thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, you know, maybe we can start with your own personal story just to get to know a little bit about you, your background as a physician of homeopathic medicine here, mm -hmm. and your interest in the uh, traditional Balinese healing methods. Yeah. And of course, I'd love to get into the legacy that you have here. I, as I understand, 22 generations long here on the island. Yes, and yes, that's the documented. That's the docu That's in the documents. So that's that's how far we can trace our lineage back to Java, which is where we, my ancestors, originally came from, from the uh, Kadiri Majapahit kingdoms. Yeah. And it was a, basically an exodus, it was an exodus. The end of an era in, in Java, the end of the Hindu Buddhist uh, dynasties. And they were given a choice if you would like to remain in the old ways, then you know, you can go to Bali. So they decided to come here. So in a way, it must be a little bit ironic because with the pandemic, there's another choice presented. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we sing a second exodus. Yeah. That's correct. We have uh, Jakarta and uh, many people from Java finding refuge in Bali and from all over the world, actually, at these times. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's incredible, actually. The, with the work I do, I have the honor of meeting. And I said that to one of the, my, my clients the other day. I said, I'm just... Every day I'm in awe at the quality of people I get to meet from all over the world. So to answer your question before, in brief, um, my father is Balinese from Ubud. Uh, and we're here on, on the land of my ancestors. This is um, a property that was, uh, we are, we're the caretakers of. We always see ourselves as caretakers, not necessarily owners because Ownership is, uh, is a highly uh, questionable, uh, uh, let's say, pursuit. And um, my mother is British Australian. I was actually born in Singapore like you. And um, eventually found her way back to Southeast Asia and uh, met my father here. And I was born in Bali in 1978. And uh, I'm proud to say I was born before electricity because <laughs> we didn't have electricity in Ubud back then. So, uh, and uh, I mean, it may have something to do you know, with um, certain predispositions I have, I guess. And when I was quite young, we moved to Australia where my, um, my brother, my younger brother was born. And I continued my education in Australia up until university. So I originally, uh, you know, I went to a, a very, you know, I led, I led a very average uh, middle-class Australian life in Sydney. Uh, played Aussie rules football, did all of that stuff. Uh, and I was very interested in music and jazz. So I, I went into uh, the conservatorium, uh, play the saxophone and realized that that wasn't for me after a year. And then I went into hotel management to uh, be the good son and run the family business, which is, it's just here. And uh, after a few years of that, I um, just sort of, it evolved. Um, I got interested in aspects like Ayurveda, obviously the Indonesian herbs and um, organic farming. I saw a naturopath. I started to, I was doing a lot of martial arts at the time and I started to really, I don't know, I, I really became in touch with what true vitality and health was. And I really liked that feeling. So one thing led to another and then my son Adi was born and um, that was a big catalyst for me. I think when you have a child, uh, your whole world kind of changes and your whole perspective changes. and. Um, 
my priorities changed and, and I'd already had this sort of brief introduction into the into the world of natural medicine and, and, and natural products and organic farming and understanding health. Uh, and I, I remember I took him to the pediatrician for just a little checkup and I thought, oh, I don't know if I don't know if I can trust this guy. <laughs> and um, one thing led to another. I had already enrolled in a correspondence. They didn't do online back then. It was correspondence courses. So I was doing nutrition by correspondence with an Australian uh, natural medicine college. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to bite the bullet and apply and see what I can do. See if they'll accept me into the naturopathic program. And they did. And so uh, in about 2002, uh, uh, we, we moved to Australia and I went back to university mm -hmm. and you know in the naturopathic university I decided uh, I, I was also studying the health sciences I wanted to get you know I wanted to get the science done as well and I'm very glad I did that especially with what's going on here um, in the world it's very important to be science be, be uh, have a science lit literacy I think these days and um, I didn't even know what homeopathy was and I remember again uh, Adi got sick and I went to my herbal medicine lecturer and she said well you, you, he's a baby you can't do any herbs for him really so take him to a homeopath and so um, I did and and I remember seeing the incredible effect of that subtle medicine I Still, at the time, I didn't really even know what it was, and I decided to shift my focus onto homeopathic medicine. So, yeah, um, I practiced in Australia for the first few years, and then remember coming on a holiday to Bali, and I, I saw more patients in Bali on holiday than I did in Sydney <laughs> <laughs> on a one-month holiday. So I decided, look, I think it's time to... to to come back and that was a really um, a decision I'm very glad that I made yeah and at what stage did you start to uh, delve back or reconnect with the indigenous practices well you know that has really been something that I've been immersed in for since birth um, it's almost like a given so my father is an elder of the village here he's from uh, He's from the palace, he's, he's from the, the lineage of uh, the protectors and, and guides of, of the people and the land. And so much of that was just interwoven into childhood. It was a little strange growing up in Australia with almost, uh, yeah, it's almost the opposite. It's incredible. It's so close, but it's, it's so different. And, um, and the sort of materialistic view of life there. Um, coming back here you know we'd come back every year and have just an immersion in a completely uh spiritual and um and mystical life so i could say that the lineage that we have here is very much connected to the mysteries it's almost like the like if you would call it a balinese mystery school or like the greeks a little bit like that so uh yeah in 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 our family we are also a receptacle with holders of many of the sacred texts, including those on healing, uh, usada, as we call it in Bali. And I would say that, just backtracking, I was probably I probably got interested in that aspect, that then led me into studies of Ayurveda and things, because to be honest with you, in the Balinese way, a lot of the transmission is oral. We do have texts which are, we call them lontars. They're written on the leaves of the lontar palm. But they are also quite cryptic. Mm. So you really do need, you need a teacher, you need a, a guide. Yeah. And um, in Bali, we don't have, uh, my father told me this, he said, we don't have a guru tradition. We don't have gurus here, traditionally. We have a few now. Uh, we have a few that are emerging now, but there's no actual guru tradition. Um, the, your teacher is your father or your uncle, or it's, it's very much lineage-oriented, family-oriented. Um, 
And so if you come from a family of blacksmiths, that will usually be, you know, trade, your trade and also your spiritual calling. And uh, if you come from a family of priests, that will be your spiritual calling. If you come from a family of healers, that will be your calling as well as your trade. See, that's the interesting thing here is the separation between trade and calling is not so big. It's often the same and um, it's, you know, there's stories all over the place here of people from, let's say, a priestly family who want to, I don't know, work in uh, banking or something. Um, and they continually reject, <laughs> I don't know why I mentioned that one. They reject, you know, they're like, you know. Poor son that wants to be a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you get to a certain age and that calling comes in, um, you can reject it as much as you like here, but things happen in your life that lead you to that. And um, yeah, there's, there's many, many, you know, I, I love talking to priests particularly in the temples and I'll often ask you know what was your story and he said yeah well you know I was working in hotels and doing this and that and then just I just kept having bad luck just you know I'd had a motorbike accident someone stole my money this that and Balinese will always eventually go back and pray in their temple and we've all got a family temple here or they'll you know they'll talk to an elder and uh, almost every family has an elder who also has, uh, you know, the shamanic abilities, the ability to, co to connect with the ancestors, to connect with the spirits of the land, the gods, and they'll be given the answers there. And many times they'll say, ah, oh, no, that's not, no, no, I, I think, I think he's, uh, he's, he's making that one up. They'll go on and then something else happens and, and eventually they'll, they'll sort of come full circle back into, into that calling. And, what always happens, even if they, you know, they've come from a highly materialistic, successful money-making job, and then they're like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be a temple priest now. On paper, it looks like they would be going back into poverty, but you'd be very interested. It's very interesting to see the prosperity that actually comes out of that. It just, you know, as we say, you know, nature's always on our side if we listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. You're already describing a little bit of what Joseph Campbell calls the narrative arc right. of a return. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, so you had your return, and uh, it's natural. It, it, it is natural. But you, you do have to, in a way, make your own way yes. away. You have to have a departure. Yes, the departure is important. And, uh, you know, there's an interesting sort of parallel between your own personal life and what we're experiencing on the planet right now, which yeah. is why I like to do these interviews, because yeah. I think people are, they're hungry. Yeah. And there is a great cataclysm between mm. materialism, mm. whether it's East or West. Yes. That's clear now that yes. we've imported imperialism and materialism everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And so even if you're part of the Asian uh, Asian society or culture is still indoctrinated yeah. implicitly by materialism yeah. and part of part of my view is that the the last 300 years of modernity has mm -hmm. reached its apex mm -hmm. yeah. and the pandemic is a cataclyst as a catapult yes. or and for what for return yeah. so your own personal return is also in parallel with a global culture returning to indigenous practice yes. and in indigenous ways of life mm. before it's too late in a way. Yeah, yeah. And if any of that's resonating right now, I'd love to just yeah. help me like, please let, take us on a little journey. Maybe I can also offer this if they're, you mm. know, one of the nice ways to talk about these things mm -hmm. is every indigenous culture that I've had the fortune to come in contact mm. with always seems to have a mythology or mm. a prophecy of this time that we're living in, whether it be the Native American prophecy of the seven fires, this is the seventh fire. This yeah. is a time right now yeah, yeah. on Turtle Island. Yeah. And in the uh, Indo-Tibetan tradition, there is the prophecy of the Shambhala, which is a great emergence or revelation. Mm. The word revelation, right. apocalypse. Yes. yes. Which most people feel is the end of the world. 
But in another way, it's not an it's not an end time prediction. It's a time of transition, yeah. like a sea change. Yeah. And we're amidst a sea change. Yeah. And that's my hope is to speak with people who know about where we're actually going. Right. And some of these prophecies are really helpful in there are signs and symptoms across the planet, not only in your patients and my patients individually, but the the very water system. The ecology is giving us a biofeedback that we're at the zenith of this way of living. Yeah. Yeah. Let me turn it over to you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, Most definitely, I, I resonate with what you're saying in that this, what is happening now, and I'm always cautious to use my words in how I describe it. Um, but I see it essentially as, as, um, as a turning point, a transformation process, uh, an alchemical transmutation, if you like. I see two realities being, um, being created, actually. We uh, described it as someone in the pre, you know, 2020, we could kind of get away with putting our feet in a little bit in both camps. You know, I'm a bit materialistic. Uh, you know, I like to do this or that, but I'm, I'm spiritual, you know. Now what's happening is it's really a reckoning. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a chance for us to really own our, our true connection. Where is our energy being invested? And in Bali, we talk a lot about karma. I see that there is an extreme acceleration of karma, karmic implications at this time. We have a prophecy here. And uh, it's interesting you talk about that because, to be honest, it's not that widely spoken about here. But since I was a teenager, I remember hearing my father talk about it. He he still talks about it all the time. Uh, And my late uncle would often quote this. uh, We call it Ramalan Joyo Boyo. Ramalan means prophecy and Joya Boy was the name or Jaya Baya was the name of one of the last Hindu kings in Java and the prophecy sort of goes like this he talks about Wala Waliki Jaman which means the 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 age where everything is turned upside down Wala Waliki means turned the opposite way the truth speakers will be called liars. Mm. The liars will be called the holders of truth. The criminals will be celebrated as leaders and kings. And the good people will be treated as criminals. Um, Men will want to be women and women will want to be men. All the values and the morals will be turned the opposite way and the asuras will rejoice you know but and the 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 prophecy is actually timed to now yes Uh, and this is not an old prophecy this prophecy goes back to the 14th or 15th century it's not that old it was a prophecy given when the when the 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 old rulers of uh, the Majapahit kingdom not surrendered, but they accepted that their children wanted to convert to Islam, and they said, "Okay, you can have you can have this place for five hundred years, but in five hundred years this is going to happen, and when this happens, we're coming back." And one of the the important figures in this. His name is Sabdo Palon, who, who is almost, he's, he's a, a wise man and priest, but is depicted almost as a sort of a pot-bellied, um, dwarfish looking figure, who's humorous, who's quite funny, but he, he's very wise and he represents the wisdom of the earth. Mm. They are the earth keepers. We always have the, we have the, the Wayang in Indonesia, which is um, the retelling of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And uh, in those, we always have these two figures. We have the prince, godlike, king, kingly figures. I mean, there's obviously the demonic 
bad guys, but then you have the advisors of the kings who are, who are these figures that are shown as almost clown-like and sort of strangely formed, dwarfish and things. And often the moral of some of the, the short stories here is, um, you know, these princes forget about, they, they ignore uh, the, the advice of these advisors. And it's, an, it's a metaphor for them becoming so connected with some sky-driven inspiration that they forget about the earth. Mm. And then eventually they wake up and they got no food. And they, they come crawling back to those who they would have called their servants and say, you know, please, please help, <laughs> help us. And I, and I, I see that's, uh, that's happening now. It's where um, we're seeing the term science being used unscientifically. Mm. We're seeing what, what science had intended, you know, to be completely objective. We've seen that being switched around. We're seeing um, leaders and situation, you know, those even, I don't know if they're well-intentioned or not, but people just making the wrong decisions. And it's usually those who've come into positions of power through, through materialistic means. And um, I think we're also seeing um, people who have, um, who have made uh, quantum leaps in consciousness during this time. Yeah. And, um, and we're seeing people who technically should be really in trouble financially actually doing quite well through, um, through just, just providence, you know, through, uh, through connection with their, um, with their spirit guides, with their, with their ancestors and, and being driven by intuition now. I see it's a, it's sort of like this, um, this dualistic split between complete immersion in the material and, um, and a, a spiritual awakening. Uh, and also incorporating, um, uh, incorporating that where, where the, the spiritual awakening is being, uh, is almost being, um, it needs to be guided by the rhythms of nature. Yeah. yeah. So that, that sounds, I mean, if I'm following correctly, that sounds like a non-dualism. Uh, that the period that we're entering into is non-dualistic in the sense that maybe for the, I mean, if we're following the astrology, the mm. astrology of the Platonic year, let's say, the, yep. the, and of the Mayan calendar, yeah, um, and of the Yuga system, yes, uh, talked about at least two thousand years period, like a clock, the great clock of two thousand yeah. year increments, yes, and the last two thousand years have been um, focused on spirituality, mm. but a transcendent spirituality mm -hmm. that then was abandoned for like a pendulum swing to material out and just mm. really, mm. really base material core instincts, yeah. the abandonment of, of spirituality as a, some sort of super, superstition. Yes. And that's only the tail end of the of a 2000 period, maybe the last 400 years. Yeah. So you had a core spirituality across the planet of transcendence, yeah. followed by a short burst of maybe two generations where we absolutely brought the planet to, to near collapse yes. because of our fixation on matter. Yes. Yes. And the next 2000 year period, according to these prophecies, mm. as best I can tell, mm -hmm. is of returning to spirituality but not the kind that's transcendent but yeah. the one that brings us back to our home this earth yeah. and into our bodies yeah and yeah. as a practitioner mm. i'm sure that's all you do all day long is to help people recalibrate their natural yeah. capacity to heal that's right and your intuition when you were studying that i'm not going to bring my son not, I'm sure biomedical and alchemical, uh, allopathic medicine has its place in, in, you, in your yeah. toolkit. Yeah, yeah. And just like science has its place in your toolkit, it's the underlying philosophy, a holistic philosophy as a main impetus, mm -hmm. and then bringing in whatever tool actually fits, fits best for any particular moment. But this, this moment here in history, mm given the pandemic, mm. 
a return to sacred wisdom culture, yeah. but not one that's based on escapism. Yes. yes. What what are you what are you feeling? Yeah, uh, you know, I feel that process in myself personally. Actually, um, there is we just. I may have even tried escapism a couple of times, and it doesn't really work that well anymore. You know, um, yeah, it's it's like you say, it's this real return to the source, and and I I, I feel it in myself. I see it in in the people coming. I mean, um, I technically should be a lot quieter than I usually am in my clinic because there's no one coming to Bali. And a lot of my clientele were visitors, uh, not necessarily tourists, but people who lived out and would come back in. And what's happened is that I'm busier than I've ever been. Isn't it true? Anybody in the health industry, yeah. mental health in my field, you can't, there's not enough hours in the day. Not enough. I think I'm booked out now until June or something. It's, it's, I, I don't even know what's happening. It's beyond my perception. But what I can see is that the people coming are really integrating those aspects of themselves that had that they sort of left untouched yeah those aspects of themselves that are now coming back for recognition and they're calling for integration so a lot so we would call those shadow aspects the shadow aspects most definitely yeah and you have a corollary in out in in the med medical uh, nomenclature and the language that you're talking about in, in your body, for example. Um, Something that you've ignored, denied, yeah, repressed, repressed, suppressed. Uh, you know, in in uh, in. Unfortunately, what's happened in modern medicine is is a tradition or a philosophy of suppression. You know, in in by modern orthodox medicine, if you want to call it that. Um, and that has now, and that's gone into psychiatry, you know. And what are the, there's some ridiculous figures on the amount of anxiolytics prescribed yeah. that have increased. I mean. No, Big Pharma it's has. Incredible. It's incredible. Big and Big Pharma's it, part of the symptom, part of the problem, right? I think so. And in Bali, you know, like you, you were talking about this coming home again, this full circle. Um, and again, I, I don't, I'm not an enemy of any medical system. Um, even though, you know, the homeopaths and the naturopaths and everything, we're sort of, uh, we're the witches of this, of this day and age. We are, I think the homeopaths are public enemy number one to big pharma. They don't like homeopaths. Um, but that's all right. You know, you know, my son was in a car accident and he broke his leg and I was very happy there was an emergency room and an orthopedic surgeon and the technology that they could use to help rebuild his leg. So I don't want to, you know, like you, you, like you say, there's a place for everything. But um, one thing that I've started really delving into is almost like, and again, this may sound a little bit con confrontational to some people, but in Bali, in traditional medicine, we look at diseases as an entity, basically. We even have drawings of them. This disease looks like this. They kind of, you know, this disease looks like this. It sort of has one leg and a, and a weird head on top of it. This disease looks like this. It's a being with sort of all arms and no legs. Some of them are a bit creepy. And it's essentially a demonology of disease. And um, one of the things my father did while, while I was growing up was he exercised. He was an exorcist. Mm -hmm. So, um, and my mother wasn't too happy about that. <laughs> he did that for about, he said his karma was to do it for 12 years. And so I had sort of, uh, I still have vivid memories of seeing people getting exercised and things. And uh, I kind of, I wanted the scientific version. So I rejected that world a lot. But what I can see now, and it's interesting, the paths we take to find these different insights, I went into, into anthroposophy, mm -hmm. the, the works of Steiner, very deeply, very heavily. And I'm still involved in a, a Steiner school that, that we've put together with many other parents as a community. And uh, his, his work on 
what is happening today is, is incredible. I mean, he predicted, when you read some of his lectures, you get chills because the things he's saying are, are playing out today and he almost predicted them to the years. Uh, and one of the things was about, interesting thing, uh, was about the, the demons we create ourselves. I think he talked about it in a lecture on lies and the phantom. And every time we say a lie, we create a phantom. And that phantom stays with us. And as I look back, and, and, and the more we perpetuate that lie, the more it grows. We, we nourish it with those actions. And um, eventually it will sort of, it, it consumes us, you know, in a way. And uh, that sort of led me on to some work of, of some other, um, other, other people, including uh, Judith von Haller who's an anthroposophist from Germany, and uh, Dr. Are Thorsen, who's a Norwegian uh, vet, homeopath, acupuncturist, osteopath, and anthroposophist. And uh, it's very, very interesting when we look at the spiritual aspect of that, and, 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 and not a watered down, politically correct new age one, you know, it's a real, it's like, you know, this is, this is the entity of this disease. This is what it does. This is how it acts. This is how, um, this is its personality. Mm -hmm. This is its likes, its dislikes. That's how we look at homeopathic remedies. Basically, we understand the, the entity. And then our job as a, as a, as a healer, or as anybody actually, I, d and I don't like to call myself a healer, um, because I believe we all heal ourselves, that's the ultimate, um, is the transformation of that entity to go back to, to the universe, back to source. Whereas what's happening with this culture of suppression is, uh, and I'm quoting the work of uh, Dr. Thorsen, is translocation. <coughs> where we suppress a disease, which is in, a, in essence is um, suppressing an, an entity, or he would even call it a demon, and forcing it to move somewhere else. And it can either translocate to a different area of the body, or it can jump over into another member of the family, and we see that all the time in Bali. That's a, that's a classic one. Or it can jump into animals. Some days in, I don't know if you've ever had those days in Bali, where all the dogs chase people on motorbikes mm -hmm. at the same time. I still remember thinking, it's like, what, what is that? I know it's got to do with the astrology of the day, but it's like there's, a, there's something in those dogs on that particular day. And then the next day they're chill, they're like, it's fine. And so what's happened with this, and I think now is one of the culminations of that, um, uh, is this culture of suppression has led to an accumulation of so many of these unintegrated, unresolved demons or entities or whatever you want to call them, that, you know, it's, it's now just become a systemic thing. And very few pra people are practicing a form of therapy that will facilitate true transformation or transmutation, which I'm getting the feeling you do, you know, um, yeah, I think the wellness industry from biomedicine all the way up to new age wellness yeah. too clearly is invested in optimal health is the big buzzword. Yeah. Everybody wants optimal health. Okay. And then there's the invention of what we call, at least in the United States, the biohack. Yes. People exactly. seem to have these quick remedies, yeah. spectacular, well-marketed. Yes. And then, of course, digital social media amplifies this message. And mm -hmm. people people are hungry yeah. for a, a quick fix. Yeah. But no, no, many people really look at what's underneath. Yeah. They, wa they want six-pack abs yeah. in, in two weeks. Yes. And then the message is, here's this program that you can adopt mm. that's going to get you there. What about all the people that can't get a six-pack? What happens to them? Yeah. They feel a lot of core shame. Yeah. What happens to the shame? It festers yes. deep in their psyche. Yes. It gets remedied by alcohol, sex, yeah. drinking, and, shopping. Yeah. They don't fit this tight mold. Mm. What if it were 
about going into the shadow, about mm. going into the core shame. Mm. In, in your parlance, it's like the confronting the demon. Yeah. And in the Tibetan, and in the Tibetan model, they definitely, before any ceremony, before any abhisheka, mm -hmm. there is the feeding of the demons, the feeding yes. of the yeah. pretas. Yes, yes. And I was in a Kala Chakra once with His, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and there were, must have been 50,000 people in Buddha Gaya where the yeah. Buddha gained enlightenment. And mm. he said that the rituals that would drive the spirits away mm. so that this place could be holy. Mm. You could see that it's like almost a biohack, like sanitize this land. Even the Tibetans have their version. Mm. If, you do the, if you do the ritual just right, yeah. you will drive the spirits away so that this we can share this little bit of real estate in Bodh Gaya for a holy ceremony. Yeah. And the Dalai Lama being the 14th and the great Dalai Lama, great 14th, and a mm. tremendous innovator, even a, even a confronter of his own tradition, mm. brilliant as he he is said we're not going to do that because if we're truly practicing compassion mm. then the pretas get to stay and have lunch with us too mm. and so he did away with the ritual to drive them away to banish them yes and instead offered them a seat at the table yeah and th that symbolism is yeah. very powerful yes the poison is the medicine yes you can't drive it out no and especially now we're in a closed system yeah. Where is it going to go? Exactly. And whether it's karma theory and you think, they think that there's another world, a heaven to get to, mm. that's the non-dualism. There is no other place. Mother Earth is our home. Yeah. And this body for this life is your home. Uh, yeah. And where are you going to drive out the illness? It's, is it, it's going to bounce in one of the dogs and then someone, so your, your auntie is going to get it and then your son's eventually going to get it. Mm -hmm. And we're not separate. Yeah. We're not separate anymore. Yes. I think one of the great things about the pandemic is that truly as a global community, we've mm -hmm. realized there's no other, we have to do something together. Yes. Yeah. Whether this pandemic wanes mm -hmm. and we l fall asleep again mm -hmm. is a choice we're all going to have to make. I don't think that's actually going to be possible. I don't think it's going to be possible. I don't think we will be given the chance to fall asleep again. I think, and, and with observing what's going on, you know, with every new variant that they want to talk about and, and all of this and um, things, things can't, nothing, nothing can go back to what it was, right? Mm. Change is inevitable. And uh, you can suppress the evolution of, uh, of humanity, if you want to call it that, but you can, never, you can never do that forever. You can hide the truth, but the laws of karma will always state that eventually that tr truth shall, shall reign. Yeah. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. So a lot of what gets talked about in even in the um, in the natural healing alternative healing circles is a lot about release you know i want to release i want to release i want to release and it's really just the uh, exchanging i want to suppress in a way so when i like to work with people what i talk about is more about integration and the transformation the transmutation because as conscious beings uh it's almost sort of our job to help those unconscious if you want to even just go in straight in and call them those unconscious entities, those parasitic beings or whatever, back to the source, which is, and yeah, because the, the other choice is uh, just letting them back out into the closed system again. Mm. I thought, you know, wow, there's not many people left doing this kind of work. But ironically, what's happened is I think that with, with the, the way the world is operating now, it's actually going to be the reverse. I think more and more people are seeking that yeah. and more and more people will find it. Yeah. I think this is, I mean, they come together. The, the great crisis and the great opportunity are coming together. I think yeah. we've already mentioned that, but I think like it's not just in our sector of health, but yeah. let's say for example, big agra, mm. we've depleted the topsoil. Yeah. We can't grow food mm. properly. Mm. We have monoculture. Yeah. It's last. It's it's been around for two generations, and we've depleted. You know, you, we're we're sick as a result of yeah, yeah. our our sickness of mind is now in us in a, a closed loop with our bodies. 
But just as it's getting to a tipping point, permaculture resurfaces. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think right down the road, I've been observing in all these sectors, for example, the banking sector, mm. where 1% of the population owns 50% of the wealth. Yeah. It's a tipping point. Yeah. In comes cryptocurrency. Yeah. And whether you have a positive or negative association with cryptocurrency, one sure. thing is true is it's cutting out the middleman. It's giving sure. power back to individuals. Yep. It's giving that choice. And the same is true in medicine. Mm. I think allopathic medicine has lit, trip, hit, hit its zenith. Yep. I'm sure Big Pharma is going to double down and it's going to try to lobby for the pushing out the small guy that's... Mm. But I think your your optimism is that we can't go back. It's only going to open. More people are becoming receptive. The third eye is opening. Yeah. Global consciousness is awakening. And right then and there, we have a huge renaissance of psychedelic medicine, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. in the West. There's a... And not like the 60s where it was yeah. all love and peace. This yeah. is researched at university hospitals from yeah. John Hopkins to NYU. Yeah. And people are respecting the plants. Yes. I'm sure there's going to be an over-commercialization happening there, too. A wave of people trying to get into the gimmick. Mm. But at the same time, you can't stop the fact that more and more people are being receptive to the plants. Yeah. So every industry, right down from the economics to the political, like one of the wonderful things mm -hmm. that I've been hearing in Bali, mm -hmm. maybe I can get your comment on, yeah. is the, um, the localization of the uh, tribal members or the, the, is it Banjar? Banjars. Banjars. Mm -hmm. So this idea that of big government. Yeah. Um, the, the big, it's too big to, to fail in a way, and at the same time, what's going to help is going local. Yeah. Local food production, but also local politics. Yeah. And ha community, what about community? We're so fragmented in the Western industrialized complex. Mm -hmm. We live a little isolated way. Yeah. I'm sure there's a corollary in the medical, in the, in the body too, isolated systems such sure. as Becoming yeah. too, you're, you're the cardiologist doesn't speak to the pulmonologist. The pulmonologist doesn't get a good family history. That's interesting. No one's talking about trauma. Yeah. It's like no one, no one talks about this to the psychologist or the social worker. It's all fragmented. Yeah. So here's a chance. Here's a chance just as we're hitting these tipping points mm. in the ecology, in the banking industry, in government, in medicine. Mm. There's also the 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 sapling has emerged mm. for an alternative yeah and what i'm taking from you is that you feel that that's not neither coincidence prophecy has said as much uh and it's not going to go away the the wave of awareness on this planet is ready to to capture this yeah yeah and i think uh i follow i, I don't ever pretend to be an expert on astrology but i do follow it you know and um various various systems have said similar things about it and i think you even mentioned that earlier as well that there is whether whether you know the powers that be like it or not there the change is coming and um a lot of those point to something big happening this year mm. you know? and i think this is uh what i'm what i'm just observing here you know in bali where it's interesting i mean I haven't been out of Indonesia for the last uh, two years now. It's nice to stay still sometimes, right? <laughs> and um, it all, it's almost like we're observing this from another place here. Because of those things that I, get, I think we as Balinese take for, for, for granted, is that the culture here, just by the very virtue of its existence and its people has has retained certain let's say uh universal cultural qualities um that that actually i think every single culture had at some stage uh we have obviously modernized in some ways but for the most part you know we still operate the same like you mentioned before, the Banjar system, the Subak system, the irrigation and farming system. Although, unfortunately, a lot of the rice, which I'm hoping to work on as well, we're, we're going to 
uh, work with the village now to plant, get back to planting really organic rice, um, the heirloom variety. Really organic as opposed to fake organic. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a lot of that going around, you know, um, unfortunately, but, uh, uh, and, and supervise it, <laughs> make sure it's really done. But um, yeah, those, I think having that, that intact cultural integrated system here from the, the community, the farming and the spiritual aspects almost gives one a, a sort of a sense of, you know, spiritual security, whether they realize it or not. It's almost, it can be subconscious in some cases, or in people who actually understand what's going on, it can be quite conscious. So and a lot of... Indi and there to the Trihita Karana? Trihita Karana is one aspect of it, yeah. Yeah, the Trihita Karana. Um, connection to nature, connection to fellow human beings, and connection to the divine or to God, yeah. Um, which is, uh, actually, to be honest with you, it's quite... It's quite a new philosophy. It's not an. It's not a documented ancient philosophy here. Uh, the origins of it are a little unclear for me, um, but it's almost like somebody decided to document what we do here anyway already, you know. Um, and no doubt we have many challenges as well especially in the farming with um with the introduction of uh of chemical farming um unfortunately the, the rice paddies are beautiful and green but they are filled with pesticides and round up and you know the 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 species of rice is not is not the original one and and all of that kind of stuff but we're almost like one, we're just a f one or two generations away from, from, from uh, a return to the natural cycle. And I think when you've still got people alive who still remember that, mm. there's something a little bit, there's something different. The elders, they still remember those times. Yeah. Um, and I think that changes something in the collective unconscious as well. So we have that opportunity now and it, uh, there, in me, Personally, there's a sense almost, I don't want to say of desperation, but there's a sense of, of urgency. It's like, don't, you know, don't rest on your laurels. Do, there's an impulse coming through now. If you work with it and move with it, it's a big wave, but it, you know, if you stand up on your surfboard and surf it, you're gonna. It's, it's uncanny that you're saying that, cause I, you know, I. I our, my school, the Contemplative Studies program, has a, a an astrologer, an oracle to really? to work with the oh, students. Nice. Yeah, that's amazing. And she said that the astrology of 2022 is much different from the last two years, and that the last two years was a period of internalization and um, being quiet and going on retreat. Yes. So during the pandemic and during the lockdown, we were doing a lot of yeah. we were doing our meditation, we were doing our study, yeah. we were stationary, mm -hmm. and we converted it like a lifeboat into the sky. Our our online programs became very robust, mm -hmm. and it was a time of disciplined study. Yeah. But 2022 is now here, and the energy is different. different. And there's a there's a opportunity for expansion. Yeah. Yeah. And. There's also what I've been talking about with my students in my community, the muscle memory of two years of stagnation also means there's some paralysis. Mm. It's people have grown accustomed yeah. to fear. Yeah. They've been indoctrinated as a result of the pandemic marketing yes. and the political yes. pressures mm. and also the social pressures, yeah. unbelievable social pressures to conform, yes. to hide, yes. to isolate, yes. everything that's anti-human. Yes. Yeah. and because of fear, people have lost their conscientiousness. Yeah. They have lost their intuition. Yeah. They have bowed down to people who have questionable authority. Mm. And if they're not careful, mm. their habit now of being stationary and separate and afraid yeah. is going to just lead the charge. However, on the other hand, if people can break that spell, mm. there's really 
I hate to use the word cosmic energy. Yeah. No, no, no. Some sort of cosmic energy that will really catapult forward the the design of something new, a new you want to call it a new civilization, a new a new body. Mm. I mean, because you were, you're a body worker, there's an opportunity for the body to heal itself, regenerate itself, but also regenerate the earth, regenerate our attitude, regenerate our our ways of communicating, regenerate our ways of thinking. Mm. And 2022 marks this turning point. So I'm, I mean, I'm very happy to make acquaintance with you. Yeah. I think this timing to meet your family and to come into your practice and come yeah. into your family home yeah. from the bottom of my heart with real sincerity, I don't think it's coincidental. No. And I feel tremendous gratitude to your whole leg legacy and your lineage for inviting me in as a guest. And also just to give you the opportunity, if you would, to wrap up here, a message of any sort that you would like about the time that we're in, we're in, and what the possibilities really are. Mm. Well, thank you. You know, it's it's uh, it's a privilege to to learn also a lot about what you're doing and and seeing how we are aligned and and I love these moments of synchronicity. I feel they're happening more and more these days. It's in, it's uncanny. This is a time of. <laughs> A testing of the willpower. So we have our mind and our spirit, we have our soul, our feeling, and we have our will. And we've we've been educated, I think, and I think like you say, it's not just in the West, it's now in the East. We've been educated to think really hard. We're even educated to feel in some ways, not, not that well in, in many societies, but it's, it's acknowledged. But in order to really enslave people, really have power over them, you take away their willpower. And what you just re described there is, is really what's happening. Every single little step every 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 app every you know a little rule you add one more little rule you add more one one more little level of automation or you take away one little freedom you take away one little freedom little one doesn't you know it's like uh and or i often use the example of uh using google maps too much mm. you know it's it's really easy to do but as soon as you get on that, you just gave away a little bit of your willpower. And uh, this is the test. It's not about, you see, I, I would have maybe in the past said, yeah, it's time for us to get back to nature and, you know, look after ourselves and, and things. But it's, it's beyond that. This is the time of true sovereignty. And uh, in order to be truly sovereign, we need to be integrated whole beings again and that includes exercising this willpower toward those things which which are basic human rights and i'm not talking about human rights in a charter i'm talking about the right to grow our own food that's an obligation to grow our own food the right to understand how your body works and heal as much as you can, although we often need assistance. That's your right, but it's also now becoming an obligation. We're being really led into um, all of those areas, even in education we're seeing it now. You know, So many people are moving to homeschooling and alternative independent types of education. This is amazing. The right to um, not to receive an education from an institution who may not have your best interests in heart, you know. So I would, I would say this is a time where we bring that in now, even though it would appear on paper that maybe we've had a lot of those will opportunities taken away. There's always a chance. And from my personal experience and from the observation of what's happening here, 
the universe will provide, you know. Those beings who are with us on the, on the spiritual realms are closer to us now than they've been before, I feel that. And um, the veils are thin. The veils are very thin. They are much thinner than they've ever been. And, but those spiritual beings who operate under the, the aegis of the true self and true human sovereignty, they won't come unless they're invited. Uh, there are plenty of other spiritual beings who will come and, uh, and want something from you, but they're not, the, they're not the ones we need to be connecting to, but those ones, so it's becoming a, a, our job, our task, I think, uh, as e each and every human to apply just a little bit more consciousness each day, just a little bit more connection to the sp spirit world, whatever your faith is, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, uh, Jewish, Islamic, you know, it's all, um, we all have that opportunity now to, to connect. And I think it's, what I see is quite an interesting thing. We're seeing now, we used to see quite a separation between religions. I actually see that fading. Now I see what's happening is it's, uh, are you on a spiritual path and aspire to this, or are you on a completely materialistic uh, path that does not recognize spirit. That's what it's now becoming. So in a way, it's a unification of the spiritual traditions, but it's also going to be our challenge, I think, in these times to, to keep our faith, keep our willpower. And I think one of, one of the things that I've really found as a key word these days is uh, to call in our courage, mm -hmm. yeah. to, to ride that wave. Um, cause, uh, the big waves are often scary, but, uh, I think any surfer and I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be a surfer, uh, any surfer will tell you that they are the most rewarding in the end. Yeah. So it's been a, a an honor and a pleasure to, to connect with you, Miles. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Wisdom Keeper podcast. If you've enjoyed this presentation of sacred knowledge, kindly like, subscribe, review, and share our podcast and video series on YouTube with your network so that more people can benefit from these teachings and together we can create a brighter future. If you're interested in my online courses, our community membership, and pilgrimages I lead, consider visiting the Contemplative Studies program at gradualpath.com. Until we gather again, all best wishes.